I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. <laughs> What's up guys, Leighton here for UFC Gambling Addicts, back again for another UFC full card breakdown and predictions video. This one's going to be Gilbert Burns versus Tyron Woodley. Before we get into breaking down and making predictions for this card, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to do a quick recap and look at the bets from the last card. If you don't want to see or hear any of that, you can use the timestamps in the description below to move ahead to the predictions okay so the bets we had a good night on the bets i always teach cover betting or hedging your bets on this channel i'm all about making money regardless of the predictions so if you've got a lot of money coming in on the main event which was walt harris you can still make money if you're wrong you just have to hedge your bets as you can see on the screen Okay, so a few recaps. We're going to do recaps really quick. Rodrigo Nascimento and Dontel Mays. What can you say? Rodrigo done exactly what he needed to do. He got the fight to the mat, used his BJJ. If you made that pick, good pick. Courtney Casey and Barella. Again, good BJJ um, from Courtney Casey off her back. Really beautiful armbar in that fight. Nate versus Darren Elkins was a great war. Really, really good war to watch for 15 minutes. Um, and you have to give credit to Nate, man. That guy was on fire. You know, he was he was pulling out the Ric Flair woo. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful performance from Nate. But you also have to give credit to Darren Elkins, man. Displayed toughness, had good moments in that fight. It was a close fight, man. Really good war. Gija Chikadze versus Rivera. Um, you know, Gija is an elite kickboxer, man. He dominated and dictated that fight um, for all three rounds, pretty much. Kevin Holland and Hernandez. Kevin Holland, man, getting it done to the body. And he's actually fighting on this card. Real quick turnaround for Kevin Holland. Miguel Baeza and Matt Brown. That was another good fight. You know, Matt Brown showing that veteran experience, nearly getting it done in the first round, but Miguel coming back in the second, showing that that youth, you know, that freshness, um, and, and that was the decider in that fight. Song Yudong versus Marlon Vera. I do feel this fight should have been 29-28 um, to Marlon Vera, but very, very close good fight as well, man. It was... You know, that first round, I feel, did go to Song Yudong. The second round, I felt close round, but it probably should have went to Marlon. And we know the third round was Marlon's too, basically. Um, decision, in my opinion, was wrong, but a very, very good fight from both fighters. Christoph Jocko versus Eric Anders. I was quite surprised with the game plan of Eric Anders choosing to grapple a lot trying to put Jocko up against the fence, which he did a lot. Um, but yeah, surprising game plan there for Eric Anders. Christoph Jocko uh, avoiding those big, powerful punches uh, and doing well in that fight. Dan Ige and Edson Barboza. Round one, I felt was Edson. Round two, for about three and a half minutes, I felt was Dan Ige's. But then the last minute and a half of round two started to go really towards Edson. He finished that round very strong. So that round really could have gone either way. Round three, I felt, was Dan Ige. So once again, maybe Edson should have got the nod. But if you go back and rewatch that 15-minute fight, especially round two, you can kind of make a case for Dan Ige. Claudia Gadela and Angela Hill. This was another one where the decision could have gone either way. Round one, clearly Claudia's. Round two, man, it's a close one, but you'd have to say, no, wait, round one, yeah, round one was Claudia's, round two was Angela's, and round three was very close. I felt it should have gone to Angela, but when you rewatch that third round, it's a close one. The main event. 
I banked on Walt Harris getting it done in that first round. We were very, very close. I did say if, if you know, Alistair weathers the storm, he's going to look to to finish it later on in the fight. You know, that second, that third round, Alistair's going to use that veteran experience and that's what he done. Should the fight have been stopped? Maybe, but at the same time, you know, Alistair was okay. You know, he got up, he dusted himself off, he got a takedown and in round two, he was able to use that experience to get it done. Good card overall, and I'm looking forward to breaking this one down, guys. Let's get into it. Fight number one on this card, we have Chris El Guapo Gutierrez versus Vince Vendetta Morales. And we're going to start with Gutierrez. So Chris Gutierrez comes into this fight, two wins, one loss inside the UFC. Primarily a striker inside the octagon. Chris had a really tough debut against a nasty fighter in Rayoni Barcelos. Since that debut, Chris has gone on to win a couple fights over Ryan McDonald um, and De Freitas, I believe. Chris has displayed beautiful damaging low kicks in both of these wins. I'd say the low kick is by far his best weapon. The opponent, Vince Morales, comes into this fight with a record that's the complete vice versa. One win, two losses inside the UFC. Also fought on the contender series in one of the best contender series fights ever, in my opinion. If you haven't seen that fight, please go watch it. Looking at Vince's UFC career so far, we have to be fair and say both of his losses are to good, good guys. Song Yudong is a brilliant young mixed martial artist and Benito Lopez is a very tricky kicker to figure out. Vince really likes to use his boxing in his fights, maybe falls in love with reading the opponent a little too much. He's not the type of guy to continuously pull the trigger. Looking at both of these guys as strikers, Chris is way more of a kicker, Vince seems way more of a boxer. Super tough one to think about in your head because skill-wise, I really do believe both of these fighters are evenly matched. If you're looking at the grappling, I'd say Vince is the better grappler, but he doesn't seem to be using it much inside the octagon. He looks to box more than anything. If Chris can land those low kicks in a similar fashion to which Benito did, I see the fight playing out well for him on the feet. So for those reasons, I'm going to take Chris Gutierrez via decision. And something I've just realised too, both of these bantamweights are actually moving up to fight at 145. So that should be interesting to see as well. So taking a look at the odds, because I haven't seen any odds on this card. I'm checking them for the first time with you guys. We have Chris Gutierrez coming in, minus 120. Vince Morales returning plus 100 and that pretty much resembles my feeling regarding you know how evenly matched both of these guys are with their skill sets you know but minus 120 minus 125 minus 117 I feel is a good price to play Chris Gutierrez on the flip side Vince Morales at plus 100 isn't a bad shout either Fight number two, we have Casey Kenny versus Lewis, the last samurai smoker. And we're going to start with Casey. So Casey comes into this fight, two wins, one loss inside the UFC. Primarily a grappler inside the octagon, a black belt in judo and a very, very decent wrestler too. We've seen evidence of that already. The Ray Borg fight in particular. We know how much of a grinder and a grueler uh, Ray Borg is and if you can compete with a guy like that when it comes to wrestling and scrambling best believe your grappling is up to scratch Casey did suffer a loss in his last bout wasn't able to figure out or take down Marab no shame there though because Marab is a very decent 135er the opponent Smolka Comes into this fight, seven wins, six losses inside the UFC. 
a veteran, if you will, of the 125 division, not so much the 135 division. Smoker had a really nice performance in his last fight, absolutely beat the brakes off of Ryan McDonald, was able to stop that fight with some nasty hooks. Now this fight I feel is an easier fight to predict than the first fight of the night. Reasons for that I believe is the size. Smoker is a good grappler, a decent kickboxer, a guy that's had quite a few fights in the UFC. However, he isn't that seasoned at 135. Casey Kenny is a strong 135er who will look to grapple with Smoker in my opinion. And if we do get that back and forth grappling contest, I see Casey ending up on top a lot. Just being the house, you know, using that size and strength advantage against the more experienced guy. So for those reasons, I'm going to take Casey Kenny via decision. And the odds are pretty, wow, okay, Casey Kenny minus 280, nearly minus 300. Louis Smoker plus 240, plus 230. So not a lot of faith going into the veteran there. And it is pretty understandable considering he is going to be the smaller guy, not that season, that 135. Casey Kenny, on the other hand, has only impressed us, even in his loss. You know, he's an impressive guy at 135. Moving into the next one, we have Tim Elliott versus Brandon Raw Dog Royval. And we're going to start with the veteran. So Tim Elliott comes into this fight, four wins, eight losses inside the UFC. A veteran of the 125 division, primarily a very unorthodox fighter. Switching of stances, jerky motions. That's what Tim Elliott is all about. He's not your average fighter. Mixing it up constantly with different techniques is something Tim Elliott loves to do. Despite having a lot of top-level experience in the UFC, Tim has lost eight of his UFC fights, you know. 12 UFC fights with eight losses isn't great, but the positive to that would be, you know, he's still getting in there with top, top-level guys. The opponent, Brandon Royville, comes into this fight 10-4 and four as a pro, primarily a grappler inside the octagon from what I'm seeing. Looking at a few of Brandon's fights, the armbar off his back is without a doubt his go-to weapon. He'll even transition into a triangle choke if the armbar is escaped. His BJJ off his back doesn't seem you know, too average, you know, it's, it looks very, very good, you know, be aware of Brandon Royville off his back, he is looking to finish you there for sure. So Tim Elliott isn't the most trustworthy veteran in the UFC, like I said, his style is very unorthodox, which gives you positives and negatives, however, in this situation, I believe it will be a positive against a fairly green fighter in Brandon Royville, a guy who wouldn't have seen anything similar to what Tim Elliott will bring to the table. But like I said just a second ago, if this fight does hit the mat, watch out for Brandon to attack and finish off his back. That's where I see Brandon having his best moments in this fight. If this fight is kept upright, Tim Elliott's unpredictability, in my opinion, will be enough. So for those reasons, I'm going to take Tim Elliott via decision. And we take a look at some odds. We have Tim coming in, minus 160, minus 170. That's a little bit high for eight losses in 12 UFC fights. Brandon Royville coming back, plus 140, plus 150. You know, it's... He's making his debut against a veteran, so I can kind of understand the line um, if, if you're telling me that. But, you know, this fight could hit the mat and Brandon Royville is looking to finish you with his BJJ. Tim Elliott, very unorthodox, you know, which is a positive and a negative. In this case, I feel more of a positive. Fight number four, 
we have Jamal, Sweet Dreams Hill versus Clidson, Russian Terror, Abreu. And we're going to start with Jamal Hill. So Jamal comes into this fight 1-0 inside the UFC. Also fought on the Contender Series. Had a very, very nice performance there. Finishing the fight on the mat with elbows. In his UFC debut, again, a beautiful performance. His striking display was pleasing to watch against a powerful puncher in Darko Stosic. I believe Hill really targeted the body in that fight for a reason, invested in the body, um, his boxing, his cardio, conditioning, everything looked good from Jamal Hill in his UFC debut. The opponent, Clidson Abreu, comes into this fight one win, two losses inside the UFC primarily a jiu-jitsu fighter. Although we haven't seen that foundation yet from Clidson in the UFC, he's mainly kept or been forced to keep his fights in a kickboxing situation. Apart from his debut, which he was completely outclassed in, Clidson's other two fights in the UFC have been fairly close fights. If Clidson looks to take down his opponent more, Looks to use his foundation a little bit more. I can see him having a better time in these close, close fights. Now, I have predicted all three of Clidson's UFC fights correct so far. But this is still a tough one to predict. Clidson clearly feels comfortable standing and trading despite being a jiu-jitsu fighter. He's been striking for the vast majority of his fights. He does have a lot of power. On the flip side, Hill has impressed me in his last two fights. Technically, very good boxing and kicking. Like I said earlier, the conditioning also looks very good. Doesn't seem to slow down or become fatigued when he's in a kickboxing battle. Very, very good matchup and quite a tough one to predict. But I'm going to have to take Jamal Hill via decision. And we take a look at some odds. Yeah, the odds are close, man. Jamal Hill coming in minus 125, minus 130. Clidson coming back a small, small underdog. And you can see why. I mean, Clidson is a jiu-jitsu fighter who's not performing too bad on the feet. You know, he, he's given a good account of himself and he's not even using his foundation. If he starts to use his foundation a little more with the kickboxing, then he could become a more dangerous fighter. On the flip side, Jamal Hill is going to look to keep this fight in a kickboxing situation. And if he does, I think he could shine there. Fight number five, we have Billy Quarantillo versus Spike, the Alpha Ginger Carlisle. And we're going to start with Billy. So Billy comes into this fight 1-0 inside the UFC. Also fought on the Contender Series. Billy's UFC debut was an extremely beautiful performance. He was able to get that fight done via triangle choke. You always love to see someone get it done with the triangle choke. It's a beautiful technique and Billy Quarantillo was able to produce that in his UFC debut. On the Contender Series... He put a real beautiful beat down uh, on the Jawayan, Kirk. Conditioning doesn't seem to be an issue for Billy. He's looking to push a hard pace on the opponent. And that's exactly what he's done in his last two fights. The opponent, Spike Carlisle, comes into this fight also 1-0 inside the UFC. Primarily a grappler inside the octagon, a wrestler and a jiu-jitsu fighter. However, that's not how Spike Carlisle got it done in his UFC debut. A huge elbow up against the fence. Really beautiful stuff. Despite that striking finish, Spike is still primarily a grappler. That's where he's most dangerous, believe it or not. This is a catchweight fight at 150. Really decent matchup. Really good matchmaking. Both guys having very good UFC debuts and they're now getting ready to battle each other. Spike is probably the better grappler. 
Billy is probably the tougher, more durable fighter, maybe the better striker too. For Spike to have success, I feel it will be similar to the debut, right? He's going to have to put Billy up against the fence, potentially look for a takedown. For Billy, I think if he keeps it kickboxing, looks to keep Spike on the outside, he could very well end this fight on the feet. Very tough decision to make, especially after taking Spike as a dog in his UFC debut. You know, very, very impressed with that um, UFC debut, but I'm going to have to take Billy Quarantillo in this one. I, there's something about this guy that I like. He's a hard worker. He's tough. He's durable. Both of his last two fights have been very good fights to watch as well. And I just feel he's going to have more to give in this fight than Spike Carlisle. So for those reasons, I'm going to take Billy Quarantillo via TKO in round number two. And we take a look at some odds, man. We have Billy coming in. A small favourite at minus 150. Spike Carlisle returning plus 130. Which is a smaller underdog price than his debut. But I do feel it's going to be, you know, if Spike wins this fight, it's going to have to be something similar. He's going to have to put Billy on the outside, up against the fence. Use his grappling or close dirty boxing or close elbows. Billy, on the other hand, I think if he just looks to dictate with the kickboxing, isn't kept on the outside, rips to the body of Spike, I think he's going to put on a really beautiful kickboxing display. Mainly boxing, you know, that's that's what we see from Billy, is, is mainly his boxing. But then again, like I said, man, the UFC debut, getting it done, um, triangle choke, both of these fighters are good fighters, but I'm going to have to stick with Billy Quarantillo for this one. Fight number six, we have Caitlin, blonde fighter, Chukagian, versus Antonina, the panther, Shevchenko. And we're going to start with blonde fighter. So Caitlin comes into this fight, six wins, three losses inside the UFC. Primarily a striker inside the octagon. Caitlin is coming off a title fight against Valentina, which is the sister of Antonina. Caitlin was completely outclassed and dominated in that title fight. No shame, no shock, right? I'm sure all of us felt only one fighter could win in that fight. Despite that title challenge loss, Caitlin is a very, very good point fighter. She's a good kicker, hits the air a lot, but I've spoken about that and how that's annoying um, to the opponent who's trying to find their own distance. Caitlin is a very experienced kickboxer. The opponent, Antonina, comes into this fight two wins, one loss inside the UFC. Primarily a striker also inside the octagon. Just like her sister, Antonina is a Muay Thai striker. Knees, elbows, kicks. Looking to tie her opponent up in the clinch also up against the fence. Antonina is basically a smaller version of her sister minus the ground game. Both of these girls are good strikers. That's what makes this a difficult one to predict. Even the fact that Caitlin fought Antonina's sister also puts a curveball in making this prediction. However, experience and boxing, I believe, sit on the side of blonde fighter. And that's what I'm going to have to go with here. Because both of these girls are very good kickers, right? To decide this fight based on the kicking, I feel, you know, isn't the best way to decide. For me, experience, movement and boxing ability, that's where I feel the decision is to, is to be made on this fight. So for those reasons, I'm going to have to stick with Caitlin Chukagian via decision. And we take a look at some odds. Caitlin coming in, small underdog, plus 120, plus 125. I'm happy with that. Antonina returning, minus 140, minus 150. 
Now, I do understand those odds because Antonina is a good kicker, just like Caitlin. She could win that area. Antonina is the sister of Valentina, so there's going to be there's going to be some good training, good preparation for Caitlin in this fight. But I don't see Antonina holding down Caitlin the way Valentina did. You know, I see more of a kickboxing, more of a point fighting battle in this matchup. And for me, my personal opinion is Caitlin has more experience. She's a better boxer and moves very well inside the octagon, you know. To get that title fight, Caitlin pretty much done the same thing every fight. She outpointed her opponent. And I think she could outpoint Antonina in this matchup. All right, homies. You know what time it is. Man, I'm so happy that so many of you guys appreciate and enjoy the smoke breaks. I didn't say it at the start of this video... So I'll say it now because I know a lot of you are here as I'm speaking. Make sure you knock that like button out, yeah? I'm not even talking about choking it out, breaking its arm. I'm talking about knocking it clean dead, all right? Masvidal versus Darren Till. Masvidal versus Ben Askren. I'm talking about leaving absolutely nothing left with the like button, right? Pure and utter destruction. Is what I want this time round, okay? So let me know in the comments how you do with it. I know some of you are going to get a little bit funny with the like button. You always do. Those comments are hilarious. But let me know. Please let me know that the like button got knocked the out, you know? And as always, if you waited to smoke, amen. If you've been smoking the whole time, amen. If you don't smoke and you appreciate the smoke breaks, we find ourselves with a triple amen, as always. So yeah, guys, I've been training a bit recently. My knuckles are cut up. My shins and my feet hurt like hell. Gyms aren't open yet, and I know I've told a few of you guys that I'm going to start training soon. But I've, you know, why wait? Why wait for something, you know? If we can get started on, on a dream or something that we want to do, why wait? Let's get on it straight away, you know? I've got the, the heavy bag put up, uh, a few more tools that I'm using as well. And obviously, you know, there's no coaches here to help me. I'm probably doing quite a few things wrong. But just feeling it out, just getting used to a lead jab, a hook, an uppercut, feeling my shins getting tougher each day. That's hard work, you know, and hard work will forever pay. If you can't do something right away, then start doing something else that can contribute to that hard work. You know, we don't have to wait in this life. Life is very short, guys. Put hard work in, you know, whether that's you like to run, you like to bodybuild, you like to paint, you like whatever it is that you're passionate about in this life. Do it. Do it every day. Dedicate your life to it, man, because that's, that's where life's at, you know. Hard work will forever pay, guys. And I'm not trying to make this smoke break like a, a mo motivational speech, but that's what I really believe, man. If you're dedicated to something, if you have dreams, if you find yourself in a position where, where you think, man, what if I don't do that? You know, you have to do it because in life, you don't regret the stuff that you did do you regret the stuff you didn't do so if you have a dream get cracking that's my little motivation for you guys during this smoke break i hope you enjoyed it um as always you know i, I appreciate doing the youtube as well the youtube thing that i do here i love that guys i honestly love it down to the the, the very core of my bones you know um, and to turn YouTube into even a part-time job in the future, right? Because my subscribers, you know, we're going up, guys. A lot of you guys are jumping on, on the train. A few of you guys have been here for, on the train a long time. And I appreciate that, right? But the subscribers are going up. Each card, we're going up. And eventually, I feel like I could 
potentially turn this into a part-time or even a full-time job, you know, that's another goal of mine, I want to get that done, and I want to put hard work in to this channel week in, week out, you know, when I first started this channel, uh, on, on a Conor McGregor Habib card, I had 300 views with 7 likes, I didn't stop there, you know, we're never great day one, and we're never great ever, but working each day, each week, each month towards that greatness, you're never going to achieve greatness, right? Because if, if you're at a point where you think I'm great, you're not going to improve anymore. You're going to stay still. You always have to improve. Um, but yeah, man, once again, this channel started and it was nothing. Two years later, it's, it's looking beautiful, in my opinion. And I want to keep improving that beautifulness of this channel. And I appreciate every single one of you who's listened to this smoke break. Listen to how I feel about this channel. I appreciate you guys more than you will ever know. And I love engaging with you guys in the comments. Alright guys. Let's get back into predicting this main card. Fight number seven, we have Mackenzie Dern versus Hannah Shockwave Cyphers. And we're going to start with the Brazilian, Mackenzie Dern. So Mackenzie Dern comes into this fight, two wins, one loss inside the UFC. Primarily a jiu-jitsu fighter inside the octagon. Training in BJJ from an age of three years old, a super high-level black belt. Mackenzie did suffer a loss in her last fight, unable to use her BJJ or use her striking effectively on the feet against Amanda Ribas. Ribas was able to completely neutralise Mackenzie Dern. It is worth noting that Amanda Ribas is also a BJJ black belt. That could be a strong reason as to why Mackenzie wasn't able to perform well in that fight. The opponent, Hannah Cyphers, comes into this fight two wins, two losses inside the UFC. A Muay Thai fighter inside the octagon. Looking at Hannah's four UFC fights, we can see a pattern. If you take down Hannah, it looks like you can beat her. If Hannah keeps the fight upright, it seems like she can win the fight also. Macy Barber and Angela Hill both able to finish Hannah on the mat. That seems to be the only real problem for Hannah at the moment. Her takedown defense isn't the worst, but if you can get her to the mat, she seems to wilt there. Grappler versus striker. Mackenzie, I'm assuming, has worked on her striking. For opponents who are able to neutralize the ground game, like Amanda Rebass, you know... Mackenzie is going to have to work on her striking there. And Hannah, on the flip side, I'm assuming has worked on her takedown defense and getting up from the mat. So both girls have to work on different areas of their game. That's going to make this fight interesting on its own. Overall, though, I do feel Mackenzie Dern is going to be the stronger fighter in this in this matchup. You know, she's She's going to look to push Hannah Cyphers up against the fence. She's going to look to just be that bully in the clinch. And if she can take down Hannah Cyphers, I do think her BJJ will be effective there on the mat. Her strength and size really plays a part in that, you know. I feel way more comfortable being on the grappler than the striker here. So for those reasons, I'm going to take Mackenzie Dern by a submission in round number one. And we take a look at some odds. We have, oh my good God. I mean, the breakdown I gave that fight seems way closer than the odds. Mackenzie Dern coming in minus 400. Hannah Cyphers plus 300. I'm sticking on Mackenzie, but playing that line would be ridiculous. Moving into the next one, we have Roosevelt, go get her. Roberts versus Brock, Chattatuska, Weaver. And we're going to start with Roosevelt. So Roosevelt comes into this fight, two wins, one loss inside the UFC. Primarily a 
young, evolving mixed martial artist. And by that I mean Roberts is a good grappler already. A tricky kickboxer too. Adversity may be the challenge and weakness for Roberts. My boy Vince Michelle was able to take down Roberts, targeted the low leg, gave Roberts some real adversity to deal with and he wasn't able to overcome. Looking at the skill set of Roberts though, I'm pleased in that area. You know, this guy's a long rangy kickboxer with sneaky good grappling too. The opponent, Brock Weaver, comes into this fight 1-0 inside the UFC. Primarily a, I'll fight you whenever and wherever type of guy. Sorry. Brock Weaver is a real fighter. You know, looking at his debut, he got a win via disqualification, which had me a little bit angry, seeing as I took Vargas in that fight, and he was looking good with the takedown too. But that fight showed us that's really the area of Brock's game that he needs to improve. Standing and trading, using his toughness is something we know Brock wants to do. But if he's taken down and made to use energy on the mat, that's where I see Brock, you know, basically wilting in these high level fights. I like both of these guys for different reasons. Roberts is a technical kickboxer who will look to use his BJJ to mix it up. Brock, like I said earlier, he ain't about that technical life. He's about the, let's just stand and trade, we'll see who's standing in a few seconds time. You know, that's Brock Weaver. And you have to have respect for those fighters too. Him and Jeremy Stevens cut from the same cloth, you know. However, I do have to stick with the technical side of this fight, and that's Roberts. If Roberts can use his kicks, use his BJJ, I see him having a really good time in this fight. So for those reasons, I'm going to take Roosevelt Roberts via submission in round number two. And those odds are insane, to be honest. I mean... I kind of get it. If, you, if you're looking at the skill set, you'd have those odds where they are. But fighting isn't all about skill set, you know. Toughness does come into fighting. Um, being able to overcome adversity, you know. That's something that I feel Roosevelt Roberts needs to improve on, you know. Because the skill set, the technique, the length, the BJJ, we like it. But what happens when someone starts going to the calf? What happens when he's the one taken down and made to work off his back? That's the only real weakness we've seen with Roosevelt Roberts. And if Brock Weaver can stay on the feet, can look to target the calf. You know, if Vince Pichel is is landing low calf kicks, Vince Pichel isn't this high-level Barboza kicker. You know, Vince is a hard worker. And that's what Brock Weaver is. He's a hard worker too. So if Brock can do something similar to what Vince did, then that plus 230 is looking amazing. But I do have to stick with Roosevelt Roberts. At minus 300, that's a little high. Maybe some money will come in on uh, on Roberts and bring Roosevelt down to, to maybe like a minus 250 come fight night. And maybe I'll play that line. But yeah, the odds on that one, I feel are a little little out of place. Fight number nine, we have Kevin, Trailblazer Holland versus Daniel, D-Rod Rodriguez. And we're going to start with Kevin Holland. So Kevin comes into this fight, four wins, two losses inside the UFC. Primarily a grappler inside the octagon. We saw Kevin just a few days ago. He was able to target the body of Anthony Hernandez. Really, really quick finish. Interesting to see Kevin is dropping down to 170. Normally fights at 85 without cutting any weight. Kevin will look to use that constant kick from a distance. If he's up close, I guess he's going to fire knees. Um, And let's not forget, you know, Kevin is a BJJ fighter. On the mat is where he's most comfortable. From a distance, he's going to just use kick after kick after kick. He's going to use that length. Up close, he's going to be nasty. On the mat, he's going to be his most comfortable. 
the opponent, Daniel Rodriguez, comes into this fight 1-0 inside the UFC. Impressive UFC debut against a veteran in Tim Means. Nice to see that Rodriguez actually used his foundation, which is also jiu-jitsu. When he had Tim Means hurt, that's when he used his foundation and got the fight finished. Daniel isn't the most experienced fighter, obviously, but it's clear to see his training at good camps, 10th Planet BJJ being one of those camps. Both of these guys are naturally jiu-jitsu fighters. Kevin, I believe, being the more experienced when it comes to BJJ. As strikers, again, Kevin being the more experienced, the more unorthodox too. Like I said earlier, he's going to throw a lot of kicks and a wide variety of kicks too. If we're looking at who's more likely to find a TKO with their hands, I'd say Rodriguez. He looks to be the way more powerful puncher. But skill-wise, overall skill, I'm liking Kevin Holland in this matchup. He's moving down in weight. He has a big reach advantage, a good experience advantage, and he's coming off a good win just a few days ago where he didn't cut weight. You know, he's, it's not like a Tony Ferguson situation where he's cut weight and he's cutting weight again. You know, everything I feel points towards Kevin here. So for those reasons... I'll take Kevin Holland via decision. And the odds, a little deep on Kevin Holland here. Minus 225, minus 230. You could probably knock about 40 off of that, you know, just down to the win the other day. But at the same time, when you go in there and perform like that, it's going to give you some confidence to go in there a few days later and cut weight. Um, and be a much bigger guy when it comes to length, you know. Daniel Rodriguez does have good jiu-jitsu. Southpaw fighter with a lot of power. Plus 200 isn't a bad bet, but I would have to stick here with Kevin Holland. Fight number 10, co-main event. We have Blagoy Baga Ivanov versus Augusto Sakai. And we're going to start with the grappler. Ivanov comes into this fight two wins, two losses inside the UFC. Training out of Team AKA, which is a very good camp. Ivanov is a Sambo fighter. That's his foundation. Apart from the Derek Lewis fight, we haven't really seen Ivanov look to grapple much inside the octagon. I guess he'll use that side of his game when he feels most at threat, you know, and anyone feels at threat with uh, Derek Lewis. That guy can sleep a plane just like Francis Ngannou. And Francis Ngannou didn't engage with Derek Lewis. So, yeah, that's why Blagoy Ivanov looked to grapple as much as he could in that fight. Ivanov, without a doubt, has enough punching power himself to hurt any heavyweight. But in my opinion, it's his flat-footed movement he becomes quite flat-footed when he's striking on the feet. And that's a worry for Ivanov, in my opinion. The opponent, Augusto Sakai, comes into this fight 3-0 inside the UFC. All of Sakai's UFC performances so far have been really good performances. I felt Arlovsky maybe could have been given the nod on that night. Apart from that fight, which was a very close fight, I feel Sakai has been somewhat of a breath of fresh air for the heavyweight division. The confidence he shows in his last fight, really quick to impose his will on Marcin Tybora. Sakai doesn't look to back down to anyone. As of right now, you know, this man's a good kicker for heavyweight and without a doubt doesn't mind trading hands either. Sakai, in my opinion, will have more confidence when it comes to kickboxing in this fight. He's taller, longer, probably quicker too. Maybe not quicker with his hands, but, but when it comes to kicking, I think he is going to be the better, quicker kicker than Ivanov. Ivanov probably should look to use his grappling in this fight, especially when Sakai slows down outside of round one. 
if Ivanov's game plan isn't to use his grappling, then in my opinion, he really is giving Sakai a lot of chances to have a good performance. It's a tough one to decide on, but I'm going to have to go with the Brazilian in this one. I've liked what Sakai has done in the UFC. If Ivanov grappled more in his UFC fights, maybe I'm breaking it down differently, but my pick is going to have to be Augusto Sakai via TKO in round number one. And the odds are very, very close. Wow. Maybe a lot of people feeling Ivanov will grapple in this contest. Especially outside round one, like I said. That's going to be important. Both lines, minus 110. You know, man, it is it is a real tough one to decide on. Sakai, just more impressive though for me. Ivanov, a little too flat-footed, isn't using the grappling enough. And for those reasons, I think Sakai potentially getting a TKO or a close decision win for me. All right, main event, guys. We have Tyrod, the chosen one, Woodley, versus Gilbert, Dorino Burns. And we're going to start with the former champion. Tyron Woodley comes into this fight, nine wins, three losses, one draw inside the UFC. Primarily a wrestler inside the octagon, although using that explosive punching power is also a huge part of Tyron's game. Many opponents have crumbled to that explosiveness. Lawler was hurt by it, Wonderboy was hurt by it twice, and Darren Till was hurt by it too. Do not underestimate the punching ability of Tyron. Yes, he's primarily a wrestler and a very strong wrestler too. And he will use that wrestling if he hurts you. But make no mistake, Tyron is a dangerous striker too. The negative to Tyron's game, which I feel most of us will agree on, is his cardio. He has a lot of muscle. And we all know muscle requires oxygen, especially when you get tired. Surviving the first 10 minutes goes a long way in beating Tyron Woodley. Gilbert Burns comes into this fight, 11 wins, 3 losses inside the UFC. Primarily a jiu-jitsu fighter inside the octagon. And a very, very high level jiu-jitsu fighter too. Damian Meyer level BJJ. Burns is also a Muay Thai striker. Kicks, knees, elbows... He's a good technical kickboxer, along with his foundation of high-level jiu-jitsu. This is a super tough main event to predict. And one of the reasons as to why, in my opinion, is how high is, is Gilbert's ceiling at 170. You know, we know he's a good welterweight, but how good is he? We know how good Tyron Woodley is. He used to be the champ. He is on a decline, but a slow decline. We know who has more punching power in this fight too. That's Tyron Woodley. Can Burns hit Tyron with something he isn't used to? Has Burns got the power to hurt Tyron Woodley? And I'm not too sure about that. I believe his jiu-jitsu is good enough for sure. But then again, Tyron has so much strength on the mat. Maybe enough strength to avoid these submission attempts. It's a really, really good main event. But I do have to stick with the more proven welterweight. Can Burns win this fight? Maybe he can. He's more active than Tyron Woodley too. But I just have a feeling that Woodley, you know, he's going to keep Burns on the outside. And I feel he will find a huge explosive punch at some point. So for those reasons... I do have to stick with the former welterweight champion here, Tyron Woodley via TKO in round number two. And the odds could be a little bit closer, should be a little bit closer. Minus 190 for Tyron Woodley. Burns coming back plus 150. It's a really tough main event to predict. You know, you can look at it in so many ways. If Burns can make it to round three, four and five, Those rounds are going to be close and they could be scored in his favour. I just don't know if Burns is going to be able to hurt Tyron Woodley. 
And is he going to be able to submit Tyron Woodley as well? Will Tyron Woodley take down Burns? Probably not, but if he does, is Burns going to be... We, we know technique-wise he has enough to submit Tyron, but Tyron's really strong. You know, he's a big guy, and that could help him avoid these submissions. It's a really tough one to predict. I just have to stick with Tyron Woodley, man. He's an explosive guy in those first 10 minutes. The power is always there. But how quick he can translate that power to the chin in those first 10 minutes, I think, is going to be the factor. So for those reasons, I'm going to stick with Tyron Woodley there. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed these breakdowns and predictions. As always, let's get engaging in the comments. All right, peace.